Happy Sabbath to everyone. Sabato and Jema. You know, I have been uh, working. You know, the last time I was here, I told you I was working a little bit on my Swahili. I don't, I was thinking this morning about uh, sharing uh, a few phrases with you and just having a conversation with you in Swahili, but you know, I'm a little bit nervous now. And uh, I'm not sure I can quite make it. Um, so let me just <laughs> say, oh, look, Nalipenda wa Nalipenda. See, see, I'm nervous. I've messed up already. But I was going to say Nalipenda watu wa mungu. And uh, and the very important thing is that uh, the Lord loves us. The Lord loves you as well. And that's really, if there's only one thing that we can ever say to, to any of us, there's hope for us because God loves us. There's hope for you because God loves you. That's the only power there is in the universe. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you think you're struggling with, no matter what you think you may be dealing with, just know one thing, one thing we have to know is that God loves you. And I, uh, as I enter into the message today, I just have to stop and share once again. I'm always very touched by the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in this church through these young people. I, uh, I have met many of the leaders of this children's ministry here in this church, and I'm always humbled when I meet them because I see the fruit of their labor. And, uh, and I just want to praise God for the young people in this church that are serving the Lord in such a beautiful way. Thank you for this children's story uh, sermon that we've heard today. And uh, may God bless you all abundantly and richly. I want to bring you greetings on behalf of the East Central Africa Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church where there are over 5.2 million of your brothers and sisters across uh, East and Central Africa. I know that uh, Dr. Raguri, the president of the division, would be uh, very eager to bring you his warm greetings and welcome, uh, and it, along with his other uh, colleagues, the uh, executive secretary, Pastor Musa Mitakaro, and the executive treasurer, uh, Elder Johannes Olana. So I bring you those greetings. And I want to just jump right into the word uh, of God today. Now, we've read the uh, verse, we've heard the scripture reading for today, which is Acts chapter 1, verse 5. And I just, I want to start there. Um, and I, I just want you to know why we've chosen this particular passage as our verse. Um, the verse says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And as I read that passage, I, I have a question, which is, what is the purpose of the power that God wants to give us? You see, when we go through our normal church life, our normal church experience, our normal church program, many of the things that we see in church and we experience in church can actually be done without any extraordinary uh, experience. We've gone to places and people can give, you know, they don't call it a sermon, they call them speeches, but those things can be done. We can have lots of programs, and indeed, they are done around the world in many different places. But the fact that God himself, Jesus, is saying that we will receive power, and then we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, into the earth that makes me ask the question, what is it about this this cause that we have been assigned to be his witnesses that requires and demands this extraordinary power that God is promising us. 
And when you ask that question, it leads you on a journey, and this is the journey that we have been going on through this week. You know, there's a preacher, there's a quote, actually, that's been attributed to a preacher named A.W. Tozer. And that preacher, I'm going to paraphrase his quote. He says, in the early Christian church, in the days of the apostles, he said, 95% of the things that you read about in the book of Acts, 95% of these miraculous things that you're seeing, they could not have been done at all without the Holy Spirit's power and his presence among the people. But then the preacher goes on and he says, but when you look at the church today, he says the, the, the Holy Spirit could leave the church entirely alone. And yet, 95% of what he sees going on in the churches could continue on without the Holy Spirit just as well. And that should be a cause for concern for every one of us. Because whatever it is that God is calling us to do demands, it requires, it is a prerequisite that we have the power from the Holy Spirit in order to do what he is calling us to do. So to me, it made me ask the question, well, what is it that God is asking us to do? Maybe what we have done is maybe we have limited the mission that we think that God is asking us to do. Maybe our thinking is a little bit too small. And so it caused me to look back in the book, all the way back in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, in the first chapter, God calls humanity, just as after he creates them in his image, he calls humanity and he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue the earth and have dominion over the animals. And this language that God is using to call his people to go out and fill the earth, he's saying not just, he's not just saying he wants them to travel and, and be in all of the parts of the planet. That's uh, a simple matter. But what God is saying that he is that he has created a good world, a perfect world. He's given them all of this perfect building blocks for them to use. To do what? God says that he created humanity in his image. And we are to take his image and to reveal his glory and his power and his goodness and his greatness throughout the earth. He's given us a perfect world, but we are to now, he wants to see what we will do with it. How we will use his power to even more fully display and reveal his goodness in the world. Well, that was in a perfect world before the world was fallen. But after sin came into the earth, God's purposes and plans for you and for me as his children, have not changed. God's intention is that his glory will be seen throughout the earth. But the call even seems a little bit more urgent now because the world is so filled with darkness. The world is so filled with pain. It's so filled with suffering. But I'm comforted by the thought that God still has a perfect plan for you and me and for this earth. And that perfect plan demands that we experience the power of God. That perfect plan calls for us to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It is not just a plan for church, a church program here in the church and we bless as we bless one another. No, it is a plan for us to be his witnesses, to reveal his glory. Yes, here in the church, here in our Jerusalem, here in our families, here in the city of Nairobi, across the nation of Kenya, and yes, even into the world. 
But we can't fully be his witnesses without his power. He has an unlimited purpose. It's not defined by the borders that we put around our church or around our family. His mission is to the entire world. It is indeed unlimited. And I love the verse that so many of us love, Jeremiah uh, 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But we need God's power in order to do it. It's not a matter of just going about and doing the best that we can do in our own strength and in our own power. In fact, we get a little bit of a sense of the calling that God has for us when we look in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9, where Peter's reminding us that we are a chosen generation, chosen by God for something unique and something special. God's people, this congregation of people that believe in the name of Jesus, we're called to something extraordinary. We've been chosen, hand-picked by God to do something extraordinary. We're chosen by God. We are, you and I, we are all part of a royal priesthood. When you come to believe in the name of Jesus, when you understand that God is your creator and that he has called you, that he loves you, when you know that, you become a member of the of royal priesthood. Every single one of us who calls on the name of Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, we are all, every one of us, ministers of the gospel wherever we go. And it requires, it demands power. Power from where? Power from God in order to preach the gospel everywhere you go. You are a minister of the gospel at home in your family. You are a minister of the gospel when you go to work, when you're riding uh, on the matatus or on the boda bodas or when you are driving your car, when you're at the supermarket, when you're at work, everywhere you go, you are called to be a minister of the gospel filled with the power of God, filled with his Holy Spirit and to speak and to act and to live in his name, according to his purposes. This is why we need his power first before we can become his witnesses. It's not just a matter of living according to the standards and the purposes of the world that we live in. My friends, God has chosen to give us power because his purposes in us are, his purposes in us are unlimited. God wants to take us somewhere to do something so extraordinary that it cannot be done without his power. Oh, my friends, I know that you and I, we are Christians. We've been believers, we're baptized, we're members of God's remnant, Seventh-day Adventist church. These people who were called to do a special work in the time just before Jesus would come. We're living in the days of, of the last days of earth's history, Jesus is coming soon. Yesu Anakuja. Jesus is coming, and we have an urgent task that must be done, but I want to ask us the question, the way that we have been living, and we praise God for all that he has done for us in this last year, in 2023, and we are looking forward to 2024, but I want to say, my friends, we've got to begin living as a chosen generation. And we've got to begin ministering in the world with the power of God. That means we can no longer minister as if we're just going through and doing business as usual. The task is urgent. And we have got to minister with the very power of God. What has it looked like for you in this last week? How many times have you needed the power of God and ministered to people, ministered in this world with his power and not just your own? 
This goes far beyond living in the way that we think that we can live comfortably and conveniently. And, uh, you know, I'm challenged when I look in passages like uh, Mark, uh, excuse me, Matthew uh, chapter 5, where Jesus is speaking, and he gives some very extraordinary statements. I'm going to just pick a few of them. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 38, 39. Jesus begins talking about the normal way. If we're going to minister according, uh, minister to the world with our power, then we can just start with verse 38 and just leave it there. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If that's the way that we're going to minister, if we're going to live in this world as just another Kenyan, as just another human being living in the normal world, and we can learn the, 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 the principles of the world, the way the world works, people can just tell you, oh, well, you know, this is the way we do things in Kenya. This is how it is in Africa. You just kind of have to know how things work, and you just live according to the cultures and the traditions of this world. And, and pastor, you know, we're just going to do our best, you know, with the situation we have. If you want to live that way, then you leave it at verse 38. But Jesus does not leave it at verse 38. He goes on. He says, but I tell you, Jesus gives us the command not to resist an evil person. How many people do we know? Is it you? that we know that does not resist an evil person. Some, when someone, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. I've been living in Kenya now almost six years, and I don't meet a lot of Kenyans who are able to do this. I don't meet a lot of people in the world who are willing to trust God and live by that standard. Don't resist an evil person. Jesus goes on, he says, um, if anyone wants to sue you to take you to court and take away your tunic, let him have your tunic and let him take, have your cloak also. No, but when people do, they want to take things from us, our natural reaction is to fight and to resist. But Jesus says, don't resist. When someone tries to take from you, Become even more generous and give to them more. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Whoever asks you, give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. My friends, this is not a normal way to live. God has chosen us to be a royal priesthood, to be a special and a peculiar people, to be different. This is why God is telling us, first, we have to receive his power in order to live that way. He says, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Are we living with God's power or are we just living the best way we know how in our own power and refusing to live according to the, to the extraordinary example and calling that God has given us? We need power to be able to do that. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, God reminds us, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I know it does not make sense not to resist someone who's trying to steal from you. I know it doesn't make sense that when someone curses you, when they speak evil of you, when they want evil to be done to you, that you should respond with kindness and generosity and love. I know it doesn't make sense, but you're a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, and we are not to live according to the ways of this world. We have to live different. 
And the question is, has God noticed that difference in you? Are the people around you noticing that you are different? My friends, when someone curses me, when they try to spitefully use me, when people are my en enemies, my friends, I'm telling you, it, it demands the power of God to come and live in me to forgive them and to love them. Oh, how I wish we could see so much more of that in the world. How, how I wish we could see more of that in the church. God has an unlimited purpose for us, which is to transform the world and show his glory throughout the world that would, in a way that will change the city of Nairobi. But the fact is, we have been living and ministering without his power, and we refuse to live and to humble ourselves and to live according to his plans and in his ways. But when we choose to do it, I'm promising you, the Lord is promising you, this city and this nation will be changed by the glory and the power of God. We have to live with unlimited faith. We've got to trust in the ways of God and in the purposes of God. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus makes an extraordinary promise to us. It's a promise that we need to hold on to because without those promises, without this kind of faith, we will not be able to live in the way, the humble, powerful way that Jesus is asking us to. But in this, this promise, we don't, we don't live the way that God asks us to live because we're afraid of what will happen. We're afraid that maybe we won't be taken care of. Maybe uh, we're just, we just have so much fear. But Jesus says to us, he says, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus will not abandon you. If our purpose is surrendered to the purposes of God, remember, God wants to see his glory revealed around the world. If we submit ourselves to that, if we become committed to that, to God's glory, more than we're committed to our own glory, and we ask the Lord to give it to us, it will be done for us. Are there people that you know in your lives that need healing and help in this world? In this city of Nairobi, there's too much pain and there is too much suffering in the world. And I believe that the reason why this city is not in a better situation than it is now is simply because God is waiting for his people to live according to the pattern that he has shown them and to call on his name. He is promising us that he will transform this city. He will transform this nation when he is allowed to transform you and in your, and your life. God is looking for a special people who will meet him, who will see him face to face, who will come to experience his love and his grace in such a powerful way that they cannot help but worship him. Worship is not a program. Worship is a response to meeting a loving, powerful creator who forgives and blesses and heals. The Bible says when we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Oh, when you meet a loving creator and a loving God like that, the only response is worship. It is a natural, irresistible reaction that we have when we come face to face with love. It changes you. That love changes you. And the only response you can have is love. That 
response of love and of awe. That response that changes the way we see things, that is worship. And in Revelation chapter 14, the first five verses of that chapter describe a people who are just in love with Christ. It says in verse one, he says, uh, John says, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. We are identified by the father. His name is written on our foreheads. And he, he says that these people, they're singing the song of the redeemed. Their identity is as a person who, does, who was not worthy of the love and the, and the redemption and the grace of God, but they have met him. And as they experience his love, they, what comes forth from them is worship, the song of the redeemed. There's truth, not deceit, in their mouths. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. All of these are just the natural response of the love that we have received from God. And when we have understood that powerful love of God, we respond by giving God all of our influence. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light, your light, so shine before men that they will see your good works, your good works that are only done because you have received the power of God in your life. When you have that power, those good works will cause people to glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are the people around you so confused by the power of God in your life, that they have no choice but to give glory to God in heaven. I pray that it will be so. I pray that as you use your influence with the power of God, that you will have a mighty impact, an unlimited impact in the world. God wants those that are hurting to be helped in this world. God wants the hungry to be fed in this world. God wants those who are living without hope to find hope, but he wants them to find it through you as you receive his power. My friends, the time for business as usual is over. The time for church as usual is over. God is looking for a people who will have an unlimited impact in the world through his power. Now, no matter what we do, no matter how much effort we put into it, how much forgiveness we offer in the world, no matter how much graciousness we display in the world, no matter how often we turn the other cheek, no matter how often we do good to those who curse us and spitefully abuse us. No matter how much of that we do, the ultimate healing of this world will only happen when Jesus himself comes to redeem the world. So we say, you may ask the question, well, if that's the case, then why, does, why is God so concerned that I do all of these things? If I can't fix the world, then why doesn't Jesus just come and do all of these things that he wants to do? Because God has given you and me the opportunity and the privilege to reveal to our brothers and sisters in the city of Nairobi and around the world the goodness and the love of God. And they will not see it as long as we are living like ordinary people who simply are committed to our religious traditions, but we are not committed to living in an, in an extraordinary way and showing them the unbelievable mercy and grace of God. It is our enemies, the people who don't like us, the people who do not expect us 
to be gracious and loving to them, who we will be able to preach to with the greatest power. When we do the unexpected through the power of, of God, it is those people who will see most clearly the power of God in us. This is why it is urgent that we forgive. It is urgent that we love. It is urgent that we give to whoever asks from us. People will be shocked to say, hey, these people, uh, why are they giving? They, I asked them yesterday, and they gave yesterday and today. They're giving yet again. I don't understand these people. We need to confuse the world with the love of God. And the Bible says, you know, in, in Daniel chapter 2, there's this statue, there's this vision that the king uh, of Babylon has. And God gives him a vision of all the kingdoms of the earth. And his kingdom is first, the kingdom is, which is uh, identified by this precious metal of gold. And, and then uh, the, the Persians come, the Medes and the Persians, they're identified by silver. And it goes down through all of the kingdoms of the earth, of this statue. The golden statue begins with gold, the head of gold, the torso of, of, of silver, and, and then the waist of, of uh, brass, bronze, and then we have legs of iron, and then feet of iron and clay. All of these are human kingdoms. This is human history being played out. But in the end of that vision, the king of Babylon sees a rock, a stone that is carved out without hands. And that rock comes and crashes down at the end of human history on the feet of that statue. And that statue is totally destroyed. And that stone that was carved without hands becomes a mountain. And that mountain becomes a kingdom. It is the kingdom of God that will bring eternal peace on earth. You see, this was God's original unlimited purpose was that his kingdom would be established on this earth and that his glory would be, would be revealed throughout the world. But when sin came, God was always looking for a people to reestablish his kingdom and still to bring his glory around the world. Will he be able to establish that kingdom through you? Will you be his agent to bring light around the world? God's purpose is to call as many people as possible to join in and to become part of that kingdom so that when he comes and finally establishes his eternal kingdom on this earth, he will be able to rejoice along with you and with all of the people who have seen, who have seen a glimpse of his unlimited kingdom of love through you. My friends, we cannot afford to live in an ordinary way. It is time for us to do the extraordinary things. Don't limit your faith to church. God wants the world to see that there is unlimited hope for them. But they will never see it as long as you and I remain committed to living in an ordinary way. Oh, okay, well, that's kind of how Christians are. They kind of live this way. They do things a little bit differently. These guys, they're Christians. They're a little bit different because they go to church on Saturday. They're a little bit different, but basically they're Christians. No, the world should be shocked. They should be confused by your unlimited love, your unlimited compassion, your unlimited grace. No matter what the enemy does to you, no matter what problems you face, you and I need to respond because the power of God has been given to us already. Let us respond and let us reveal unlimited, unlimited light in this dark and fallen world. Oh, my friends, I don't even have time to share with you the beauty of this love, but let me just share just a little bit. This is from Revelation chapter 21. God's purposes will never, never, never be defeated we began in Genesis chapter 1, and now we come to the end of the Bible. 
chapter 21, verse 21, John says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with him, with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God is looking to reveal his glory across, across the earth. And I'm skipping down to verse 23. He says, John says, I saw no temple in the city, this new city of Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are his temple. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. My friends, when we choose to live in a different way, we cannot live like ordinary Kenyans, ordinary Africans, ordinary men and women in this world. God is looking for us to live in an extraordinary way so that people will be able to see his unlimited light, his unlimited hope for them. Our friends, this is the week of prayer. We have been bringing our prayer requests, and it is my prayer request, and I believe it is the Lord's prayer request, that you and I will come to live in an, in an extra, extraordinary, unlimited way, revealing his unlimited grace. I want to invite you now if you have a prayer request, if you want to say to God, Lord, I'm ready to live in an unlimited way. Lord, I'm not looking to receive glory for myself, but all of my resources, all of my time, all of my intelligence, all of my opportunities. Lord, I want to lay them at your feet. And I want to confuse the world with your glory. Lord, I want to be different. If that's your prayer today, I want to ask you to stand. If you will do this, the Lord will transform this city. He'll transform this nation. If you have a prayer request, maybe you have a celebration for what the Lord has done for you this year. I know there are many that are celebrating weddings and anniversaries even this week. Uh, we want to praise God for those things. It's okay, let's give God glory for those things. But as we give God glory for those things, we also surrender those same things. We surrender our marriages to be different kinds of marriages, revealing his unlimited glory. There are some of us who have prayer requests. We're asking for the Lord to give us children in our families. As we ask the Lord for those blessings, it's okay. The Lord wants to bless you, but he also wants to use those blessings for his glory. Some of us are looking for jobs. The Lord wants to give you the job, but the Lord also wants you to give him the job, that you will use that work for his glory. You're not there to earn money for yourself. You're, er you're there to earn money to be used for his kingdom, not for building your own. My friends, if you have a prayer request, you can come and put them in the boxes on the side or you can come up and stand here. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the city of Nairobi. I want to pray for the nation of Kenya. There is a greater hope than we have come to believe. We come to believe that it's just church as usual, that we will come and worship this week and next week we'll come and we'll do it all over again. No. The world wants to see something extraordinary in us. And unless we're willing to give up our pride and to live with an extraordinary faith, it cannot be done. God says surrender all. Surrender all to him. And he promises he will use you to reveal 
his unlimited love, his unlimited hope to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your unlimited purposes. Lord, your purpose to, to provide hope and help and healing to the world. Lord, we thank you that you want to do it through us. God, we confess it's not easy. It's not easy to live with humility and trusting that your ways are higher than our ways. Lord, it's not easy to turn the other cheek. It's not easy to forgive those that hurt us. It's not easy to bless those that curse us, Lord. It's not easy. But Lord, you have given us your power so that we can do exactly that. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we have fought for our own kingdom, fought to have glory and respect and appreciation in our own lives for ourselves. No, Lord, forgive us for that, but Lord, please help us to live in an unlimited and in an extraordinary way so that the world may have a glimpse of your unlimited love for them. Oh, Lord, help us to trust in your great and precious promises. Help us, Lord, to live with prayer as the foundation of our lives. Lord, we can't do it, Lord, unless you help us. Lord, help us to call on your name so that we are not tempted to try to live according to our own strength and our own power. Oh, Lord God, we want to have an experience of your presence in our lives that is so powerful that the natural response that we cannot even, we, we can't even hide is a response of worship. It was a response of praise. Lord, I pray that you will help each one of us to love you with such a complete heart that all of our influence, all of our time, all of our financial strength, all of our money, Lord, all of our education, all of our property, all of our life is devoted, Lord, completely to you so that we can use it for you to influence the world to also fall in love with Jesus. Lord, we want Kenya to be changed. We want Nairobi to be changed. We want the world to be changed. And it can only be changed, Heavenly Father, through the power of your love revealed through us. God, do it, we pray. Have an unlimited impact so that the world may have unlimited hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.